as he said, my name is Lennon. Uh, I live here in Portland. Uh, I currently work at Reed College, where I spend part of my time uh, helping undergraduate students who want to learn how to code, learn how to code, or who already know how to code, apply that to projects. Um, it's not teaching in the academic sense. It's a paid work study sort of thing. Um, so in some ways, it's an extension of stuff I've done as a manager and as a team lead in industry, but sort of different focus, different priorities. Um, it's been really interesting. That's just been a project for the last six months or so. Um, but I spent a good portion of the last, say, five years working as an engineering manager leading software development teams. So this talk is sort of a personal take of what that experience was like, some of the things I learned, making the adjustment from being an engineer to being a manager, um, things that were hard, things that were fun. Uh, so it's a, it's a very personal story. Um, it's not like, you know, I've done some training and some research, but this is not a thoroughly researched talk. Um, and if you disagree with any of this, please, please reach out, you know, throw your hand up, say something. Like the, uh, some of these are subjective. A lot of these are subjective opinions. Um, and so it's not a, this is how you do it. It's a, this is how I've done it and thought about it. Um, you know, sort of what I want to talk about. Uh, I joke sometimes that I got nerfed in going into management. If anyone's not familiar with that term, it's like a gaming term when there's an adjustment to the rules of the game that makes something that seemed really powerful and awesome really much less powerful and awesome um, to sort of balance and make it fair. Um, but it, it's true, you know, moving from engineering to management is a career change, and it's a different set of skills and a different set of, of activities. And so uh, I would not recommend that anyone seriously consider it if you are just looking to get all of the power, mwa ha ha, make all the decisions. It's not actually how it generally tends to work. Um, I do think you should think about it. I do think there are some interesting parallels. Um, I think if you care about a lot of the stuff that's been talked about at this conference, Kronda's keynote yesterday was awesome. There was a whole bunch of stuff about how organizations should get better. Well, guess who's in a position really directly to help those organizations get better? Managers, hiring managers, people who are doing career planning, who are sort of setting the tone for what teams think about and value. So if that stuff seems exciting and important to you, you might think about considering some work in management in addition to your technical work. Um, and then, yeah, just some things to try. Again, based on my experience making this change, making it a ways into my career, you know, 10 years plus after starting coding, um, what helped me and what might you consider trying to do? Um, I, I put this apology in here, but I sort of forgot the audience. Like, Open Source Bridge is not really a conference where we're all about, like, show me the code. It has to be technical. If you're talking about, like, squishy human stuff, like, I don't want to hear it. So I don't, I don't think this first apology is really super uh, necessary for this room. Uh, the second gets back to what I said, though, about this being kind of an anecdotal personal story. I'm not going out and collecting a bunch of industry data to show that teams that are managed in this way perform this much better than teams that aren't. Even if you buy into that kind of methodology for like system science and organizational science working, um, I haven't done it. It's really hard to do a blind study on like how to manage a particular person in a particular team, right? All I can say is like you try to adapt, you try to sort of notice what's working and what isn't and change from there. But there won't be cold hard data to back up all of my assertions in here. Um, and then a second point, which I want to get to only because there is a whole, you know, mode of thought in especially the tech industry, and it's not just tech, but sort of business, that says like, get rid of all the managers. Super flat structure is the best. Managers are overhead. They just create little petty power structures. They don't actually benefit the organization at all. Um, I'm not really going to try to refute that. I, I do actually personally believe, from my experience, both as a developer and as a manager, that there's real value that managers can contribute. Um, some of the reasons for that, like. Top reason, it, who here has read some version of the tyranny of structurelessness article that floats around sometimes? I highly recommend you check it out. Google tyranny of structurelessness. It's sort of a reaction to this take out all the managers, take out all the visible power structures. And you know, basically the whole theme is there's always power structures. There's always people who have authority. If those people don't have a title, if they don't have an organizational role to go with that authority, then they don't have any accountability to the organization. They sort of use soft influence to make stuff happen, but then if stuff doesn't work right, if something terrible happens, you can't go to them and say, this was your responsibility, you made this decision, it went terribly. They just shift out of it and say, oh, well, no, I didn't tell, I don't, I'm not anyone's boss. I couldn't tell them what to do. Generally, as a manager, you can't tell anyone what to do anyway, but you're at least sort of on the hook if things go horribly, horribly wrong. 
And so I think there is value in having people who are responsible for defending their team, being the tiebreaker in decisions, helping to sort of guide the direction of the organization, and then accountable to the organization and to their team when stuff doesn't work. Um, there's also a lot of stuff as, as companies grow, as organizations grow, there's a lot of overhead, crosstalk, you know, team all, like all hands meetings or new HR practices or things that happen to you that aren't directly related to your day to day work. Having a manager is like having a, a personal assistant for everyone on the team to take care of that stuff. A good manager is going to be running interference on that stuff, presenting you with only the most essential bits that only you can do. You have to sign this piece of paperwork. You have to attend this training. Other stuff, they're communicating, they're processing, they're helping to sort of smooth out for you um, so you don't get buffeted by changes in sort of what the company's thinking about or what the leadership wants to do. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about, when I say management here, I'm not talking about project management. I'm not talking about how to get software out the door faster. I'm talking about people management. I'm talking about career coaching, development, support of your team. Um, and I, project management is super useful and a super complementary thing to software development, but it doesn't have to do with, hopefully, hiring, firing, promotion. Like, it's different, right? So this is more the, the HR role of management, how you work with people and how you develop and coach them. Um, so really, short version of how I got into this position. Because um, I spent most of my career being like, I am a coder. I don't want to deal with any of this business stuff. I never want to work for a big company. I never want to get outside of my comfortable shell of coding. That seems terrible. It means going to meetings and talking to people and doing all this stuff that isn't technology. And who would ever volunteer for that? Only idiots or power mad you know, sociopaths. Um, but it turns out, if you find yourself in an environment where things are really working well, it's just your team is growing. You've got a lot to do. There, there's the need to have some support. Again, like I said, that sort of people support role of a manager. You're going to have managers, right? Like you don't get to just, in most cases, if you're in an existing organization, say, no, nah, 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 we don't need a manager. We're good. We're just going to sit over here and code all day, right? Somebody's going to insist. At least somebody needs to like approve your vacation paperwork and sign offer letters for new hires. And you do want to hire people, right? Like you probably want to bring in good people to your team. So you probably need a manager to help smooth that process. Um, and so you get to this really painful point where often your current manager just can't scale. They can't hang with the number of people they've got. Um, my personal max was 22 people reporting to me. That was terrible. I wouldn't recommend anyone ever try and manage that sort of scale. Um, and the time when I became a manager was when my then manager was hitting a similar point. He had 17, 18 people reporting up to him. He had more people coming into the team to work on stuff. And he just couldn't, there wasn't enough hours in the day to get everything done. There wasn't enough time to meet with everyone every week and sort of stay up on how everybody was doing. And so he basically said, we need some managers. You have a choice. You can discuss among yourselves, and somebody can put their hand up, or I can go hire someone in from outside. And so we discussed among ourselves over you know, some beers and took some time. And you know, I, I used to jokingly say, we drew straws, and I got the short straw. It wasn't really that. But I hated the idea the least of anyone on the team at the time. <laughs> I had worked as a team lead before. I had done a little bit of project management. I sort of saw how like, you could help and you could sort of contribute as much or more as you could as an individual developer. So I thought the idea wasn't aberrant to me. I, I could give it a shot, and so I volunteered. And I ended up um, initially managing a team of five people. Uh, two years later, when I left the company that I was working at then, I was managing a team of close to 50. Um, so this was a very extreme growth situation. Um, it was for a little microblogging company in San Francisco. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so it was a very weird experience. I would also not recommend that anyone voluntarily make their first experience in management be a place where you're going to have 10x growth in your team in two years. It does not leave a lot of time for reflection or <laughs> sort of contemplation of what you're doing. Um, but it does force you to sort of get over it and get on with the job very quickly. There's not a lot of time for, for second guessing. But so in, in a more typical case, you, know, you might see yourself confronted with this opportunity or choice or curse, however you want to think of it, um, with a really typical success story for a team. right? You do some stuff, and it works really well, and you launch it. And it's like, yay, the market's responding. You know, folks are signing up. It's a huge success. And so what's the reaction of most profit-seeking companies or even just attention-seeking and reward-seeking organizations or organisms, do more of that. Expand it, do it faster, add stuff to it, you know, stay ahead of that wave, right? 
So one common solution for how to do that is add people, right? If, if four people can do a, a good thing, maybe six or eight can do more, right? So now we're in this growth cycle. The team's getting bigger. There's more and more to do. You know, things are initially great. You're really excited because you're like growing the team. But weirdly, there's this sort of dynamic that happens where as the team grows, it starts getting slower. The cost of doing things goes up, not down. And so maybe the team is doing more in aggregate, but the amount of work that each individual member of the team feels like they're getting done is lower. You're spending more time in meetings, more time waiting for other people to do things for you, more time waiting for deploys or reviews. It's just not clicking the way it was before. And it's not because you haven't hired amazing people to add to your team. These may be the best people you've ever worked with, but something about a team getting bigger um, means you kind of need some help. Um, and I, I like to sort of chalk this up to an analogy with technical debt. Hopefully everybody in the room is familiar to some degree with the idea of technical or tech debt. So you take shortcuts, you try and move really fast when you're building something, and you leave a mess behind. Stuff that doesn't scale, stuff that throws errors randomly, you have to restart the app server every 24 hours, whatever, right? And you tell yourself you'll go back and fix it later. And sometimes you get to go fix it, and sometimes you don't. It's an organizational choice. You're choosing speed over quality in at least the near term. Well, I think you get a similar problem with your organization and the way that your team operates. You have organizational debt. Lines of communication break down. People are having weird meetings with the wrong people in them. Uh, broadcast email is rampant, and nobody can pick the stuff they want out of the fire hose of incoming email. Right? And so if your team is growing, if you're doing more stuff, if you're accelerating, you're probably accruing both types of debt along the way, technical debt and organizational debt. The problem is that as software developers, we spend a lot of time analyzing and rooting out and trying to correct for technical debt. Right? We see it as inelegant code, as unperformant systems, as obvious things to fix. The organizational debt, we often don't get the training and sort of exposure to what it looks like. We just think of it as, oh, big company bureaucracy, or oh, that's just what happens when you work for other people, or you know, these sort of defeatist things. But that's not really true. A big organization, yes, there's some overhead, but it isn't inherently slow, at least for each individual team. There's no reason why, with the resources of this bigger group at your disposal, you can't be doing epic, amazing things. But you end up in this sort of gridlock where the organizational debt makes decision making, communication, collaboration, all the things you need to do with other people really slow and difficult. So maybe you're that kind of person who starts noticing this stuff, and you pick up on these patterns, and you start talking with your manager or with your project manager or somebody about like this organizational debt. Like, oh, you know, I noticed it really takes a long time to do our stand-ups now because we've got 12 people who are spending two and a half minutes each talking about what they had for breakfast and all the bugs in their queue. Like, it's really distracting, and it's bumming me out every morning, and I'm not getting stuff done. And so you start accumulating some of these ideas and observations, and maybe you're sharing them, and then, oops, <laughs> time for a new manager, and guess who's full of opinions on how we can do things better? You, congratulations. Um, you're a manager. Maybe you're not. Like you, Most sane organizations will give you a choice. But if you're tempted, if this is something you've been thinking about, this is one sort of gentle path into this role. Um, to your manager, it's great. It's time to start fixing everything. Now you have the authority, you have the role, you have the time to focus. Um, a word of caution. Remember sort of the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, right? So in your new role as manager, it is not time to change all of the things. Yes, your goal is to make things better. But if you just start thrashing and flailing around trying to find the optimal solution for everything all at once, you may throw away what the team has already done that works. Right? So start with the assumption that you've got this good team. There's good people on it. You accomplished all these things. That's why you got the go-ahead to hire and to grow and to do more stuff. Well, don't throw everything out. Start identifying you know, pain points and fixing those. But assume that things are not horribly broken to start with. And you want to evolve rather than you know, revolutionize how you work. But this is hard. Like It's a really strong instinct when you've been waiting for the chance to fix stuff and change stuff, to not just jump in and do it. And honestly, in my experience, the folks who are worst about it are the most senior, most experienced managers. You see a new VP of product get hired into a company, and the first thing they want to do is just reset the whole product plan for the next two years and build this grand vision. It's how they show impact. It's how they show leadership. It's how they show their own vision. right? And it's terrible. <laughs> it's much better to come in and acknowledge the hard work that's gone in, acknowledge how the team has been effective and great and 
even when it's not true. Start from that point of view. That's how you present it. That's how you, you know, that's how you start. Is like everyone's been doing their best. We've accomplished some great stuff. Now let's find easy ways to make it better. Um, so really, the first thing you want to do as a new manager is not change everything. It's get to know your team and get to know them in the different way that a manager needs to know their people than just your peers, right? Um, it is not the same as being socially friendly with everyone who you manage. That is actually really hard, and it's something to think about before you decide to manage a team if it's a team you've been on. If your best friend in the world sits at the next desk over coding with you all day and you put your hand up to manage that person, it will change your relationship with them. So this is not like go out for beers and swap life stories with everyone on your team. That's fine too if that's how you bond and how you communicate, but this is get to know them as people in the organization, as people with a career plan and goals, as the folks who you are responsible for and accountable to now, not your best friend. And probably the hardest time I've seen people manage, and some of the hardest times I've had as a manager, is when I'm managing people who I'm super personally close with, and I have to do the hard stuff of managing when I don't want to do anything to upset that person. So this is not become everybody's buddy. But you get to have the best meeting in the world. In my opinion, the best type of meeting in the world, which is a one-on-one -on -one meeting with somebody on your team. This is somebody smart. This is somebody doing great work. This is somebody who you know pretty well. And you get to spend 45 minutes a week just talking with them about stuff. And like, it can be anything from a counseling session. I had one guy who I managed who just would literally like plop down on a couch in one of the conference rooms and be like, I'm ready, doctor. It's time for the counseling session. Right? And that's fine. Um, if they've got a lot to unload, like that's a totally legit way to approach it. Um, but you get to just sort of ask open-ended questions. No demands, no pressure, just like, what's working? What's not working? Tell me how you're feeling. Like, are you frustrated? People are usually at least a little bit frustrated at work. There's friction. There's stuff that's hard, right? So coax that out. Listen to that. Um, figure out if it's the same problems over and over or new ones, right? If it's the same problems over and over, you may not be doing your job. So if the same person is telling you the same thing every week is really in their way and really bugging them, and you haven't found a way to either get that out of their way or change their thinking about it so they realize it's not a huge problem, it's just it's an opportunity, or it's the way the company operates, it's the reality of the market, you know, whatever you need to do, um, that's important. New ones every week, probably OK. Because if they're not recurring, then you're moving on. You're, you're progressing, right? So still, take those seriously, like work on those. But, but it's not the same thing as somebody banging their head against the same problem week after week. Your greatest enemy, however, as a manager, and this is, again, where one-on-ones are so important, is burnout or disengagement. And they come together often, right? You should get very good very quickly or try to at knocking the microphone directly off your shirt in the middle of a sentence. Um, you should get as good as possible very quickly at detecting the signs of burnout. And that could be folks who just, it could be body language. You know, I just, uh, I, don't, I don't know. This week's fine. It's, uh, it could be um, them flying off the handle, getting irritated by minor statements in a pull request from a colleague. Um, it could be somebody just, their productivity just drops to the floor. And they're like, it's weird, because usually they're just super consistent, even keeled, cranking stuff out every week. And all of a sudden, you notice like they haven't done anything in a month. And they haven't come to you and said, like, hey, I'm blocked. I can't work because x, y, and z. They just seem to have lost the will to do anything. Usually, that's not because they're lazy. Um, usually, it's because something is upsetting them or making it hard. Um, and disengagement is folks who blow you off. They're like, ah, I don't really have anything to talk about this week. It's probably not true. Almost no one has nothing to talk about after a full week or two of not talking to their manager. Ask them about their vacation. Make water cooler talk. Like, most of us spend a large portion of our time in, at work in front of a computer with everything, all of our contact with other people mediated by that device. If you can't find something to open up and talk to another human being about for 45 minutes a week, I'd be really surprised. Right? The most introverted, nonverbal, Techie people, like all the stereotypes, still want to vent to somebody. Even if it's just like, I can't believe she just keeps committing code with two spaces instead of four, like we said in the style guide, and I'm just going to lose it. Right? Like, that's fine. That's, that's a conversation. That's an opening. And you can work through that. Right? Um, 
but really they're the best meeting. This is what I said about getting to know your team. This is how you do it. It's not big group introductions. It's not reading their resume. It's not even watching their work. It's getting to know them one on one every week. This is a luxury that we have in this industry that a lot of people don't, right? If you work as an educator, if you work as a shop manager, if you work in a lot of other fields, it's not expected that you're going to take the time to work individually with everyone you manage on a regular basis. And yet it's considered part of the standard tool set and part of the standard work week for most folks in tech. Um, and that's great. That's a wonderful opportunity as a manager. And it's a wonderful opportunity as a team member. Um, the other thing to focus on early on is making sure that you are available to your team. It can be really easy to throw yourself into all the meetings, oversubscribe, volunteer for all the company committees and things or you know, group discussions, you know, get to know your boss and their peers and everything else and all of a sudden you're never at your desk. Your calendar has no cracks of light visible in it anywhere. Um, one, you have to watch for your own signs of overwork as a manager. Uh, two, you're not available to your team if there is a tiny crisis, if there's a production incident, like bad code got deployed, right? And you are not at your desk. You don't have any time to pay any attention to it. Not saying you need to fix it. You just need to be available. Maybe all you need to do is go run and get coffee for the folks who are fixing it. But if you can walk over and say, hey, how's it going? Can I get you a cup of coffee, a donut, get out of your hair? What would help? That goes a huge way. But you have to be available. You have to have time and slack in your calendar to do that kind of stuff for your team. You also need to be making introductions between new hires and their buddies, between folks on your team and folks you overhear at lunch are working on similar stuff, between folks on your team and potential mentors for them elsewhere in the organization or elsewhere in the sort of industry. Um, that's a big part of your role as a manager. You're a connector and communicator. So do that. But again, you have to have the time to sort of encounter those serendipitous opportunities and act on them. Um, and then social opportunities. You know, while you don't need to be the best buddy of everyone on your team and they don't need to be everyone else's best buddies either, um, it's better if they see each other as human beings and they're at least cordial, right? Constant, like, brusque, like, ignoring each other in the hallways isn't going to really build a strong team bond. So if you can create lightweight social opportunities, team lunches, quick out, outside activities. Um, you know, the sort of default choice for this in a lot of, especially like venture-backed companies, is like, go get everyone rip-roaring drunk at a bar after work. Not going to say that's the right thing to do. It's a fun release every so often for teams that like it. But if it becomes the standard thing, then it's, it's got its own dysfunctions beyond the physical and mental toll on everyone on the team in terms of who it includes and excludes and everything else. But, you can still use time out of the workday resources from the organization to find opportunities for your team to interact on stuff that isn't just a particular uh, project, chunk of code, pull request, whatever. And now, one of my subjective but strongly held opinions. <laughs> Managers should not code, should not code on the core products or products or projects that the people you manage are working on. Um, there are a bunch of reasons for this. First among them to me is what I said before about being available. You are there to handle crises. You are there to meet with somebody. You are there to go meet with a candidate. Whatever you need to do sort of on the spot. If you are coding, if you are head down in flow, you're not even going to notice that request coming in. Or if it comes in, you're going to be annoyed because it's pulling you out of coding. Um, the other dysfunctional version of this, where folks won't give up coding because they've become managers that I've seen, is folks who manage all day during the work hours when their team is there, and then they go home and code all night. Because they feel like they have to make progress on the code, but they can only do that when email and meetings and everything else are erased from the equation. So to my mind, a people manager should not be coding, at least on the critical path for stuff that the team is working on. Um, you, you need that time and energy for other things. And some of these are things you never would have done before you became a manager. Recruiting, this is now your problem. I don't care if you have recruiters and HR and other people in the organization who are there to facilitate. You own the makeup of your team. Just like you own keeping the people on it happy and productive, any new people you add, that's your responsibility. So you need to become an expert in recruiting. Um, career coaching and promotions, part of keeping your people happy is probably making them feel like all of this is going somewhere. 
Like it's developing towards new challenges, new opportunities, other incentives for them. Uh, that's very important, and it's your job. So you need to have time for it. Uh, and complimenting someone over a pull request is not the same as talking with them about their career goals. Project and team planning. Like I said, not project management, but you need to understand how well your team is aligned towards the projects you're going to be working on. Are they realistic? Is there too much to do? Can you possibly fit it in? Um, do you need to hire? Uh, and then training and knowledge sharing, right? Making sure that the team is supporting each other, that they're educating you know, their colleagues, other people in the organization, customers, about what they're building and why, how it works, um, and that they're building sort of shared ownership and understanding of what they work on. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that's important later. The flip side being, I do believe coders, programmers, software developers can make great managers. So not while coding, but take a lot of what you already know and you already do and you already think about and apply it to a team and an organization instead. So one of the things that is almost uniquely possible for software developers turned managers is to help cut through sort of tech problems their team is having. Right? So there are great managers with no technical skills who will not be able to do these things in a way that makes sense to the team. Right? So you hear Velocity talked about in sort of agile circles as this idea that you assign abstract points to tasks and you see how many points the team earned in a week or in a sprint and you compare it to the next sprint and the previous one and decide if you're doing better or worse. That presupposes that all of these things are roughly the same size and there's no variation in the technical complexity or whatever. So when I say velocity here, I don't mean agile velocity story points. I mean understanding is the team moving steadily and shipping code or are they blocked? Are they having problems that should not exist because of technical limitations and issues that they're encountering? The architecture doesn't scale. Uh, our dependencies on this service are too high. Uh, the latency of these other services we talk to is too high. We have to engineer the hell out of workarounds for it. Um, you sort of hopefully have this spidey sense you developed over your time as a software developer about when stuff is hitting sort of the breaking point, right? Like, yeah, the error rates are really coming up on that service, like, and you're even zoomed out a level from what your team is working on. So you may see, like, this person notices it one day, this person notices it another day, this person notices it a third day. Now you have a pattern. For each of them, it wasn't a pattern, but now for you, it's a pattern. Well. In your role, with the time you've left on your calendar and all the sort of support you've offered your team to keep them free from other distractions and frustrations, you can call a quick huddle. Do a root cause analysis on a bug that just slipped through testing. Um, use that technical knowledge, especially around sort of patterns and quality, to figure out when the right time to sort of hit the brakes and say, hey, we need to look at this. Is. And you know, is everyone familiar with rubber ducky debugging? Um, I'm seeing a lot of nodding, a uh, few that didn't. But really quickly, it's a uh, CS professor has a rubber ducky on his desk. Students can come by for office hours anytime to ask any question about homework, projects, whatever. But before he will say a word, they have to ask, explain their problem to the rubber ducky in clear, plain English. Vast majority of the time, before they're even finished with the process of explaining the problem to the rubber ducky, they've already figured out the solution. They've turned around and walked out the door. So anybody relatively, who's a relatively good listener can practice rubber ducky debugging. But those cases where the ducky didn't solve the problem for you, now this is where you get to lean on your experience and your knowledge, even just to ask questions. Again, it's not you're the expert who's going to solve the problem, but you could sort of ask some probing questions like, oh, did you check the log? Did you, you know, oh, is it different since we added this other sort of API endpoint? Oh, it is? Well, it's that maybe. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, go check that out, right? You just sort of offer some leading questions, but help them sort of work through technical barriers. And then, again, you have these technical skills, so you can pitch in in certain ways. You can help out in a technical capacity, even without working on the core product or platform or tool. You can write docs. You can write tools that automate and support the work of the team. Um, you can explain and translate between teams, because you speak nerd. <laughs> So that's great, right? Like you're not going to go and have to like wait for them to do the English translate, you know, oh, you know, the the DBA team wants to roll out an upgrade to the MySQL cluster. Can we find out like what's changed, what we need to be prepared for? You can go as envoy and go ask that question and come back with a coherent response. 
And if you uh, become a manager without having that technical experience first, that's going to be a lot harder. You can still connect people directly, and that's fine. But if this is something you can do for your team so they don't have to worry about it, great. Um, and you can do meaningful uh, sort of support in the form of like bug and in incoming bug and ticket triage. You can actually sort of parse what they're saying and figure out the right component or team or individual to sort of take it on because you understand the technical underpinnings. You're not just doing pattern matching on a single word in the ticket to figure out where it goes. Um, yeah? I think it's a really interesting sort of overlap area. So in, in case anyone couldn't hear the question was, what about pull requests? Um, I, think, I think it can be a great way to contribute. Um, and I think it can be a nice way to handle, especially pull requests from new people on the team or more junior folks who might not be comfortable totally with the feedback from, from the rest of the team yet. The danger is um, you don't want people to defer to your opinions because of your organizational authority instead of your technical knowledge. Right? And so jumping in on something that's a quick two-line review just to like get it through the door, sure. Um, giving somebody some positive feedback, especially early on in their time on the team, absolutely. Um, getting into a contentious architectural discussion, like whether this proposed implementation is good or garbage and should be rewritten from scratch or whatever, like I think you should weigh out of those unless you have to play tiebreaker um, because people will defer to you as their manager, even if your idea is worse than theirs. And so you have to be really careful. And this goes for design discussions, any sort of technical input you might have. You don't want them to, you don't want the good ideas to fail to surface because you didn't agree with them. Yeah? Uh, uh, related question, how do you feel about um, like following the project, leading the code, like mm -hmm. Hundred percent. Keep an eye on the code. Understand, and and it's a great one-on-one -on -one topic. Actually, if something ha if there's no crisis, ask the ask somebody to explain the architecture of what they're working on. Ask them to explain sort of what's painful, what's approaching the need for a rewrite. You're going to find yourself being the advocate for like maintenance and s sustaining programming sometimes, where like your product manager or your marketing folks are saying, add this feature, add this feature, add this feature, and you might be the person who has to go to the mat to say, actually, we need to pause and go fix up this mess that's like a time bomb waiting for us. You can only really do that effectively if you understand the mess. So yes, read the code quietly, you know, sort of observe the flow of docs and PRs. Um, you know, I read a lot of PRs without saying anything, just to see what's going on, to understand the patterns and, and what's flowing through the team. Um, and then, yeah, be, be equipped. And like I said, it fills in any dead time in one-on-ones. Just ask a technical question. And usually, folks will be glad to explain it at length, right? So, so everything I talked about here is sort of like your early days as a manager, right? So it's, it's survival. It's like don't, don't overcommit. Don't burn yourself out. Don't get your team sort of imprinted on bad habits and behaviors from you. Um, and, and keep yourself available. So you've hit that. Great. You are now an effective manager. So you're getting like, maybe this happens in the first 60 to 90 days. And it really does take that long. This is a new job. You're learning how to do it. So now you're 90 days out. And now you actually have room to breathe and start thinking about what comes next. Um, this is where I said we talk a little bit more about teaching and training and mentoring. So uh, one of the great things you can do early on in your time as a manager is identify your sort of deep experts on your team. Right? People are going to have different areas of expertise. Some folks are more junior. Some folks are more senior. Identify your handful of experts. Um, and if you think you're one of the experts today, that's fine. You won't be after a while. You get away from the code long enough, you stop shipping stuff. You will cease to be the deep technical expert on that piece of the system. Um, but take those experts and, and push them. Get help from them, in particular, to train and sort of expand the knowledge of other people on the team. Not to do more, more, more code in that area, but to get other people mustered to help them. because. Everybody knows single points of failure are bad, right? We don't want those in our systems. And yet, we let them happen all the time on our teams. Oh, Isabel is the absolute expert on the database schema. No one else can work on it. Nobody else understands it. So we have to route everything through her to fix that. Well, that works great until she's on vacation for a week or decides to join another team or just pieces out, moves to San Francisco, right? Like, so. We don't want those. So we, it's really easy to say, like, oh, the outcome the last time I asked this person to do this very technical thing was really good. I should just ask them to do it again. 
actually you should be thinking more long term, more strategically about like, how do I get them to help someone else do it a few times so that somebody else is trained up. Now they're teaching, now they're training other people. You're, you're breaking up that single point of failure and that lack of redundancy in your team and spreading knowledge. So now it's shared ownership and shared understanding. Um, and so your standard operating procedure should be every expert needs to be actively engaged in identifying and training other people to be able to do what they do. Um, as a manager, your job is to create the space and the sort of process and pressure for that, right? So anything, any of these things your team is not already doing, help them sort of spin up and start doing. Um, and anything they are doing, continue to run interference and keep room for them to do it so that the pressures of other groups' demands on their time, shipping new features, fixing bugs, you know, whatever, don't squeeze out these really important activities for your team. So code and design reviews, right? Pull requests, sort of day-to-day, -day, sort of code review is great. Big, you know, pre-launch design reviews or production readiness reviews are also a common thing if you want to make sure that a big chunk of work is fully sort of vetted and ready to go. Um, these are great teaching opportunities, right? Um, a weekly or some regular cadence of demos, walkthroughs, sort of success stories of like, here's what I built or here's what I'm thinking about is great. Walking through code for the other engineers and walking through running software for anybody who will show up to look at it. Again, it's a teaching opportunity. It's a chance to explain sort of not just what you did, but what you learned while you were doing it. Um, and I am a huge fan of Hack Weeks. They're not something that every organization can pull off or wants to pull off. I think they are amazing because they create a safe space for people to go learn a new thing and explore and maybe fail completely. But that's written into the contract for a hack week if it's run right, or a hack day, or however you want to structure it. But you just create a space where it's like, hey, you're an expert in X. Go do something not X and like come back after a week and tell us how it went. And by the way, everyone else in the organization or everybody else on the team is going to be doing something outside of their comfort zone at the same time. So you don't have to feel embarrassed that like your productivity fell off while they were all cranking away. Right? So I think it's wonderful to try. Happy to talk with people more about what it takes to set up and run hack weeks within a larger organization. But I think it's, it's super valuable. Speaking of valuable, part of what you signal as a manager is what you value and what the organization values. So people align themselves towards what the organization values until they decide it's so out of whack with what they value that they leave, right? So ideally, you're communicating values to people, showing that through actions and rewards and whatever else, and they're, um, they're responding well to it. So one of the things that might, hopefully, is at least somewhat within your control as a manager, is incentives. Um, Everyone familiar with intrinsic versus extrinsic incentives? Intrinsic are things that like, make you want to do stuff because you want to do stuff. Extrinsic are like, I know you don't want to do that, but if I give you this dollar, will you do it? Um, there's a balance. Not that, no work that, that we do is entirely intrinsically motivated. Even open source, there's like desire for prestige and recognition and authority and whatever else. Right? There's, there's some extrinsic motivation that comes in for most people in any work that they do, and certainly any paid work they do for a job. Um, so you want to create good incentives. Right? You, want to, you want to, wherever possible, maximize the things that mo people are already motivating people to do the work anyway. Emphasize those. Um, and watch out for really toxic ones and, and sort of the game theoretic implications of certain types of, of incentives. Um, for folks who aren't familiar, Microsoft use, used to use a system called stack ranking, where every manager ranked the people on their team from 1 to n, 1 being the best person on the team, n being the weakest. And bonuses and promotions were apportioned accordingly to where you were on that list every review cycle. That set up some horrible, horrible toxic side effects. Like people would deliberately go choose with weaker, they would choose to go work with a weaker team where they would be the one because it meant they got the rewards and incentives, as opposed to working with a strong team where they're somewhere in the middle of the pack. And they get to learn a lot, and they get to work on a great product. But when it comes time to hand out the extrinsic you know, compensation incentives, um, or even just do their review and sort of build their record, they, they were reviewed poorly. Um, and so you have to be really careful about that. And if people come to you and tell you they think something is toxic, that it's upsetting them, they think it's setting up the wrong incentives, listen. And try really hard to understand why, and then Go fix it if, if you agree. Compensation being kind of the biggest extrinsic motivator that most co companies use a lot. It's really stressful to talk about, both as a member of a team and especially as a new manager. Um, your job is to get people over that. You want them to come talk to you about compensation, because if they can't talk to you about it, they're going to talk to a recruiter somewhere else. 
If they're not happy with their compensation and they don't think they can approach you and talk about it, then they'll just talk to somebody who wants to listen. And that's going to be somebody making them an offer in another organization. Um, so the, the main thing to sort of reassure them is just broach it yourself. Be aware of what your team's making. Ask them how they feel about it. Make it clear that talking about money you don't see as evil or disloyal or mercenary. It's a big part of why people are there. You need to understand it. Use it appropriately. Be fair. Be transparent. It doesn't mean give twice the salary to your favorite because they came and talked to you about it early. You know, pay people according to the work they're doing and their experience and everything else. But be transparent and open. Uh, this is what I would love to spend an hour talking about all by itself. Titles, promotions, tech ladders, so many fields, uh, so many opportunities to use this to really motivate people to have constructive conversations about their career plan. Oh, you're a senior engineer. You'd like to be a lead engineer. Here are the attributes I think of as embodied by a lead engineer. Here's where you're already nailing it. Here are the things we can work on together over the next eight months so that by next review cycle or whatever, you're ready and I can make an un out, like, unvarnished case for you to be a lead engineer with all the benefits that come along with that. Right? That's a powerful tool as a manager when you have it. It's great to structure that conversation and, again, increase fairness and transparency around who gets promoted and why. Um, but people also, like I said, feels, they get anxious, they get nervous about how this works, they don't understand it, or they try and game the system and just chase titles instead of outcomes. So it's, it's hard. I would really love to, to talk about it a ton. If you're curious to see a longer format document that encodes some of my thinking about it, uh, shortly after I started at Urban Airship a couple of years ago, I wrote a tech ladder for engineers and managers. Uh, it is on GitHub. If you go to GitHub and look for tech ladder under Urban Airship or come to me and I can give you the URL. It's just a bunch of markdown documents and they describe seniority levels and titles and why. Um, <laughs> hiring, like I said, you're responsible for recruiting. Too much, sorry. Don't have time. Another great talk worthy of its own hour or more of discussion, um, but it's so dependent on the organization, on the role, and not something I can gloss over in a couple of minutes. Um, we are coming up towards the time limit, so I'm going to kind of cruise through these last few things. Again, uh, if folks want to stick around, ask questions, chat more, we'll have that 10-minute window or whatever um, in between, but I'm going to try and really just blaze through this stuff. So there is bad stuff. It is not all wonderful. Um, there are some terrible meetings, and as a manager, you're probably going to get invited to all of them to start with, right? And so you have to learn to identify these and kill them with fire. Um, so the, the biggest sign is a recurring meeting where nothing gets decided. When your calendar starts filling up with recurring meetings where no decisions are being made or solutions are being proposed, destroy it. Don't, don't create, the, absolutely do not create these for your team. You should be finding out what you need to know from them every week through your one-on-ones, through automated reporting. Like, I don't even think project status is a good one-on-one -on -one subject. I think I can get that in email. So I'd rather get a weekly email from everybody talking about you know, what they're working on than dwell on that in one-on-ones. And I certainly don't want to put 20 people in a room to go around in a circle and report on it every week at length. It's, it's soul-sucking. It's a huge waste of time. And if you ever want to try to hack around it, um, there's some great like websites and like iPad apps you can get where you enter the number of people in the meeting, sort of their average salary, and hit start, like a stopwatch. You just put it in the corner of the table, and it ticks up dollars the whole time you're in the meeting. Works great. Um, <laughs> so you know, meetings for a purpose, where you're going to make a decision, you're going to do a root cause analysis on a problem, you're going to design a new system, brainstorm, whatever. Those can be great. Even, even retrospectives after a big release or something, awesome. You have a goal, you have a plan, you have stuff that comes out of it. It's not just a big circular status report. You will have to have some of the most difficult conversations of your entire career as a manager. At some point, if you do it for a while, every one of these things uh, will happen to you. You will cancel a project that somebody really likes working on. You'll put someone on a performance plan because they're not doing their job well. And you have to tell them they're not doing their job well. You will deal with HR issues, reports of harassment, inappropriate comments, people who feel like other folks aren't showing up for work or are considering another job. Like all these sort of complaints, they, should, they flow through you, right? You are the appointed agent of the company to deal with this for your team and to take complaints from your team and bring it to the appropriate people elsewhere in the company. This is a very, very important responsibility and one that uh, not all companies do a very good job of training you on, especially in Oregon. California, it's required. 
certain th topics have to be covered for new managers. Oregon, not required, so not universal. Um, you may probably, almost certainly, eventually will have to fire someone. It is the worst thing you do, will ever do at work. You probably, if you've done it right, if they've been on a performance plan, if you've been meeting with them every week, if you've been really transparent, everyone will feel better after it's done. But that experience of telling somebody who doesn't want to leave that they have to leave, no fun. No fun at all. If you find it to be even the least bit fun, please get the hell out of the industry and out of management because I don't want you messing with people's heads that way. Um, and you will lose people from your team who you really like working with and who you value very highly. They will come to you and, and fire you as a company or you as a manager. And sometimes that's because they've got some great new job they're really excited about. They're starting a company with their best friend or their college roommate or whatever. And you really can't argue with that. But sometimes they're going to come to you and say, like, eh, it just hasn't been working. I'm sorry. It's, it's not me. It's you. I'm out. <laughs> right? And that's, that's not very fun either. right? Um, and you can, you can talk through it. And sometimes they're asking to be like, saved and, and kept, but usually not. Um, the only trick I can really give you for all of those is just be really clear. Don't back down. Your instinct is you, you're trying to make these people happy every day. So your instinct is going to be to avoid any subject or conversational topic that makes them unhappy. So putting, going into a meeting to put someone on a performance plan, you need to be super crystal clear what they're not doing, what the plan is. Here it is in writing. We're going to agree to it. right? You have to be super clear, and you cannot back off and leave the room with them feeling ambiguous about what you talked about or what their status is. Yes? And make sure people know what the stakes are. Totally. Yes. This is not like, oh, this is how I want you to improve. This is, you are on a performance plan. Here is the time frame for the plan. If you do not complete this plan satisfactorily, termination could result. Right? And so, yes, you have to be crystal clear, laser clear with people in these conversations. And that will not be your natural instinct, because you're normally empathizing and supporting. Um, last thing, a couple of ways to sort of cope with the stress and newness of this and get better as a manager over time. Um, really cut yourself some slack. Like I said, this is a new job. For most people, these are totally different skills and mental muscles than you exercised every day as a software developer. So know that you're not going to get it all right to start with. Um, I still apologize to the folks who I first managed occasionally when I see them. I'm like, I really screwed some of that stuff up, guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and thankfully, they understand that, and they cut me some slack, too. Um, also, you know, have a way to measure what you're doing. It doesn't have to be something that like, your boss holds over you as your top sort of goal. Um, I had an informal measurement for a while after I had managed a little bigger team for a little bit, which was how many people came to me from elsewhere in the company and asked to move on to my team. It wasn't an official metric. It wasn't tracked anywhere. But every time that happened, I was like, oh, that feels pretty good. All right, maybe things aren't terrible over here if folks are like, if they want to come join us. Um, Find a peer group, right? We're really good as, as developers now at finding meetups, online groups, whatever, where we can sort of share what we're learning, share our pain, et cetera. There's this feeling you can't do that as a manager because some of the information you deal with is sensitive. It's HR sensitive. It's personal. But there's a lot that isn't. You can generalize. You can talk about how you're feeling. Um, you can aggregate over many experiences or change names to protect the guilty, whatever you need to do. But find peers who you can talk through what you're working with. Um, and I really like like a breakfast club, like find three or four people who work in similar roles, whether it's at the same company or elsewhere, and just get together once a month and just like kvetch. It's awesome. Um, there are some good online resources and communities now. Uh, Rand uh, of Rand's Repose, uh, uh, Michael Lopp is his actual name, writes a great blog on management. He now has a Slack community that they'll openly invite anyone to if you're interested in engineering leadership and management. Great resource, great bunch of people. Um, you can demand basically as much as you want from your organization because you are doing so much. If you do your job well, you will recruit, retain, and develop amazing people. And so they should be bending over backwards to support you and making that work. With all of this pressure, why should you even bother? It sounds awfully hard. The first one, and this was one of the very first sort of quantitative things I figured out, I call the 25% rule. If I have five people on my team, and I make each of them 25% more effective by managing them than they would be under some other manager who understands them less or cares less. I just got 6.25 people out of the deal. That's better than them plus me. So 25%, that's all you have to do in terms of happiness, productivity, whatever, for each person on your team. Five people on your team, you have now crushed you know, what you would have done individually uh, in terms of contribution to the team. So that's a, a modest goal. You should be able to smash that. 
Um, and you get the opportunity to make your whole team, organization, or company better, right? It's not like you make the product better, you make the technology better, and that sort of benefits everybody. You now get to sort of hack the organization. You get to find what works with, on your team and share it with other teams and sort of expand it. Um, and that's great. That's super high leverage. Um, and it's just a chance to try out something different. You're still working in the same industry, maybe for the same company. You're working with some of the same people. But the way you work changes. You get to stretch some different mental muscles, um, try something new. And if it doesn't work, you can go back. That's the amazing thing. In a, in a really functional organization, you can try it for a while and be like, you know, I don't think this is really working. I think I was happier coding, and I think everybody else was happier too. And probably if you feel that way, other people feel that way, and it'll just, you can go back. It's fine. Um, so that's it. Thank you.